However, increasingly here lately, you are starting to see this thing now called a limited service agency, a limited service agency, meaning they may not offer as many of these services to their clients. They are called an unbundled the service. So let me explain. So let's say a seller comes to me and says, hey, Raymond, I want you to list my property and I want you to put it on the MLS and, and answer the phone in case a buyer calls. But I don't want an open house. I don't want the CMA. I already got the value in mind. I don't need help with a, a lender or a help with a home inspection. I just want you to do a limited amount of your services and because of that, I'm only going to expect to pay you 2% or 1% or a flat fee. And I would say, sure, that'll be a good deal. Now I'm not having to worry about scheduling an open house. I'm not worried about having to call an appraiser or a home inspector or any of that because I have unbundled the services and I'm only offering <clears throat> a limited amount of services. These service companies are legal. And what I am starting to see is more and more companies going to this concept because, and I'm going to say this, and I don't know if I necessarily believe it 100%, the internet now provides a lot of consumers with information that they used to only be able to get from a brokerage. Like, what's the average home sale in the neighborhood? What's the average days on the market? How are the school systems? That, all that information now can be found more easily by the consumer so they don't feel like they need to ask a broker all of this stuff. So, therefore, they want the broker to limit their services and they are going to expect to get paid less. All right? There are companies out there currently. There's a company called List with Freedom. There's a company called DIY Realty. All of these companies offer limited services at a reduced commission to the client. And the only thing these companies are really doing is providing access to get their property on the MLS. Now, that is all fine and dandy. You could actually do what's called an a la carte system. So maybe your limited company does offer to put the property on the MLS. And then you say something like, you know, for 1%, we're going to get your property on all of the listing sites. If you want an open house, you can add $400 to that. If you want a CMA, it's an extra 200 Just like other companies upgrade or upsell, or for those old people that are in the class, you guys remember when Bell Phone Systems actually started doing that? I think they did that a little bit on mobile phones when they first started. If you wanted caller ID, you could add $2 a month. If you wanted the ability to three-way call on your landline, you could add another $1.50 a month. So they had a base price, but then you could add on a cafeteria style. If you are employed by an employer, you probably have seen something very similar where they say, okay, we'll give you uh, health insurance is this amount of dollars per month. You want to add on the vision plan, that's another $2 a month. You want to add on a dental plan, You want, and you can stack or pick certain elements. Well, yeah, I want the home inspection, but I don't want the, uh, you know, caller ID, and so therefore this is my fee. There are brokerages going to that. If they claim they are limited services, there are three things that all companies must do. <clears throat> by definition, to be considered a real estate brokerage. So here's what the limited services have to be. 
the minimum level of services that all brokerages must adhere to. Now, some states don't require brokerages to adhere to the Minimum Level of Services Act. Indiana does, all right? So at a minimum, you must accept the delivery and the presenting of the offers and counter offers to the client. So you are the intermediary. The actual buyer or buyer's agent can't deal directly with the client. They have to deal with the agent. You must help your client. You've got to give them the benefit of your knowledge and you will assist them in developing the offers. You will assist them in negotiating the offers. And you are required to answer questions about the offers and counter offers and contingencies. So these three things are what we call the minimum level of service. All right. If you want to hold yourself out as a brokerage, these are the bare minimum things that you have to do to in order to claim I'm a brokerage. OK, you can't just take their money and put them on the MLS and never call them again. No, you've got to be available for questions. You've got to receive the offers and present them to the client. All of these things are at a minimum what is required of you at a limited service agency. So now down here in this section called fees, you can charge fees. And this is kind of what we charged, talked about a minute ago. Uh, I told you earlier, one of your fees could actually be your commission. You could actually charge as an hourly rate, just like an attorney or an accountant where you track the hours. You can actually charge a fee for those cafeteria plan type of items. We just said that you could say, hey, you want pictures? I'll take pictures with my iPhone. You want a professional photographer, add $300 to the fee for listing. You want an open house, great. We can have as many as you want at $400 per open house. So a limited service agency could charge fees so that that person could say, you know, I want that fee. There, You may be able to offer fees to what we call a FISBO. That's a new term I'm sure you've seen. It's pronounced FISBO, F-S-B-O, which stands for a for sale by owner. Some states have specific laws on what you can actually do to help a for sale by owner. Because remember, if they've not hired you as an agent, then you are limited. You can't really help them. Some states allow certain help to be done. You might be able to perform a CMA for them and say, okay, you do all the brokerage, you do the listing, you owe, but you want to know how much your house is worth? I'm going to charge you $100, go out and do a CMA, which I know is a term we haven't talked about. It's a comparative market analysis. We're going to do a whole chapter on it called the comps. You might say, okay, I'll do the comps for you, and you go back, do your report, come to that for sale by owner, and go, hey, your house is worth 380 in that range, all right? You could charge for that fee. Some states limit that. Now, because this business is a business, we also have to adhere to true business laws. The big ones are like the Sherman antitrust laws. Antitrust laws. You hear this a lot. I know windows have been brought up on antitrust issues. Before we talk about that, I want to go over and explain two terms that you're going to need to know inside of this antitrust. So there are these two prefixes that we need to talk about. There is the word inter, like inter means inside of. No, it doesn't. <laughs> My bad. I guess I need to know what I'm talking about, right? Across. So let me give you an example. The internet is across computers. The interstate goes across states. Contrast that word with, now we'll get to the one, 
intra means inside of. Intranet. There are huge companies like Eli Lilly and Ford and Chrysler that may have their own internet inside of the company, and that's the only place it exists. So you have to understand that there is a difference between the word intercompany and intracompany. Intercompany means between the companies, across the companies. Intracompany means inside of my company. Now, that is important because of this reason. When we get to the Sherman antitrust laws, I'm going to tell you that these laws are illegal intercompany. They are not illegal intracompany. So let's go back and look at it and see what we're talking about. So the first major law that the antitrust, uh, Sherman Antitrust Act deals with is this thing called price fixing. Price fixing is where brokerages intercompany get together and if they all say, you know, if we all charge 10% across the board, we can artificially inflate the value and all make more money. That is illegal. It is illegal. I cannot call all of my other broker friends that own companies and go, hey, Bob, hey, Dave, hey, Susan, if all of us start charging 10%, we can all make more money and nobody change, just all do the same high inflated rate. That's price fixing. That is illegal intercompany. I can't do it across other companies. Um, there was several years ago, Irving Material that make the concrete company, they got caught all of them meeting in a barn, all of those quick creek companies, you know what I mean, that make, you go to Lowe's and you buy the sack of con instant concrete. They all met in a horse barn secretly and they all agreed that if they, they all were going to raise their price and they got caught and they were fined heavily. I mean, to the tune of millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. Now, in truck company, Price fixing is legal. What I mean by that is I, as the employing broker or the managing broker, can tell all of my agents who work for me and represent me in deals that we only charge 12% real estate commission. You don't like that number? Go find another employer. Seemed kind of rude, but I want you to get the point. The point is, in turn company, it's illegal. It violates the Sherman Antitrust Act. In truck company, it's not. Group boycotting. All of the brokerages cannot get together and try and run a company out of business. Intercompany. Inter I can't call all my friends that I just mentioned and go, hey man, if we all quit using that title company, they're going to go out of business. Let's all run them out of business by not using them. That is group boycotting. That is a violation. In truck company, I can tell my agents that represent me, hey, I don't want you to use ABC title. Their software is crap. They're very slow. We don't use them. Now, other companies want to use them. That's fine. They have the right but my company is not going to use them. That would be legal because it's intra-company. The allocation of customers. You cannot divide the market between the brokerages. I can't call my buddy Andy who lives on the north side of Indianapolis and I'm currently sitting on the south side. I can't call him and say, hey dude, Everybody that calls me that lives north of uh, 38th Street, I'm going to give to you as a client. And everybody that's south of 38th Street, I want you to give to me as a client. 
That is called allocation of customers. Somebody on the north side may want a south side broker because I'm moving to the south side. That is a violation. However, inside of my company, it is legal. I could get a phone call from a client that says, hey, I want to sell my house and I live out in uh, uh, Jersey City. Oh, okay, well, I've got an agent that works for me that lives in Jersey City. I'm going to give you to Rahim and let him be your listing agent to represent me because he lives there. He understands the market. He knows the high points of the city, things like that. I can guide my clients to different areas based on, hey, that person lives over on the west side. I'm going to give you to my agent over there. You live in Fortville. I'm going to give you to my agent over there. Because inside of the agreement or inside of the company, these are all legal. The next one's going to be this thing called a tie-in agreement. Or a lot of times you hear it called a tying agreement. A tie-in or a tying agreement is where you force a client to buy a second product to be able to use the first product. There is many, many lawsuits against Windows and Microsoft for tie-in agreements, you know, where they say, okay, the only way to use this software is on a Windows device. You have to buy Windows to actually be able to use this software. They have been accused of this many, many times. Uh, they bought a company and the, the government accused that as a tie-in agreement because what they did was they forced people then, oh, you want to use that software, you now got to have Windows because we own that company. So that was the tie-in agreement. You cannot force someone to buy the pit just to get to the cherry. Black and Decker got sued for this. Uh, they had a staple gun that only used a certain size staple that was only produced by Black and Decker. And the only way to use those staples was to buy that Black and Decker staple gun. And the government ruled that was a tie-in agreement. Now check this out.